This particular point turns us from the first six chapters, which have been focused on life under the sun without a God-centered focus. We come this morning to chapter 6, verse 10, and the last half of the book will describe the wisdom of a God-centered focus. In the last half of the book, you will see the word wise or wisdom 35 times. And so we're going to shift focus today to the last half as we come to chapter 6, verses 10 through verse 12. Take your Bibles and follow along, please, beginning at verse 10. Whatever one is, he has been named already. For it is known that he is man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? For who knows what is good for man in life all the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? If I were looking to outline this passage, there are four very simple truths this passage brings out to us. And you may want to take note of them because my purpose today is to take this truth and build upon it. First of all, the simple reality is providence is God in control. Look, if you will, at verse 10. All of us are living lives which God himself established for us. Verse 10, whatever one is, he has already been named. You may say, how has that got to do with being predestined? Well, if you take the very next phrase, he tells us that man is his focus. Man is created in the image of God, by the hand of God, and therefore God is in control. The second thing that he reminds us of, if you will notice, please, is this. The last half of verse 10. For it is known that he is man, for he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Fighting with God is pointless. It's an error in thinking. It's an exercise in futility. It's vanity to reason with God and resist God, to try and counterman God and complain. God is sovereign, and as our creator, and as the one who's in control of the world, he puts us in life situations that we would not choose, but he still is in control. Notice thirdly in verse number 11. He says, since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? You and I are powerless to change our circumstances and not live where God has placed us. All of the fussing, all of the fighting, all of the feuding, all of the frustration, all of the anger, all of the discouragement, all of the feelings of despair, they're not going to correct what God wants to be done in our personal lives. He is the potter and we are the clay. And so he gives us a perspective on how to look at the future. The perspective in verse number 12. For who knows what is good for man in life all the days of his vain life which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? One of the greatest evidences of contrast between God and you and I is God controls tomorrow. Nothing we do is going to change what God plans for tomorrow. I have been for a long time reading from a book 
The book is entitled The Valley of Vision. It is a collection of prayers from the days of the John Bunyan Baptist, Puritans, and Pilgrims. I'd like you to listen to one of those prayers, and they are all the same caliber. I read this, and I am almost ashamed of what we pray for, and more ashamed of what we don't ever pray for. But this is a common practice of how they prayed up until about 50 years ago. The recognition was that the Christian faith is not about the Christian. It's about God, his word, his will, his son, his redemption, his glory in time, and his eternal purpose. I'd like to simply read this, and I'll read it slowly because it's a lot to digest. If I preach like this is written, the three of you that snored last Sunday would be multiplied by 20. <laughs> there weren't three people snoring, but you get my point. We just are not where the church was. You may not believe in apostasy, but I believe in it. And the Bible teaches it. And apostasy is not at the tail end. There is a beginning of apostasy, and it happens inside the church. And I think if you'll just listen to this, you'll be stunned at how they prayed and how we pray. I do not know who this prayer was prayed by. Often preachers in those days wrote their prayers. And I can understand why they did it, because it kept their minds focused on higher thoughts rather than generalities and rambling. Listen carefully. My God, thou hast helped me to see that whatever good be in honor and rejoicing, how good it is to he who gives it and he who can withdraw it. The blessedness does not lie so much in receiving good from and in thee, but beholding thy glory, thy virtue, thy honor, to see the amazing beauty of God in the creature, speaking, acting, filling, shining through. There is no greater good that humanity can see. Thou art good in all times of peace. Thou art our only support in the day of trouble, our only sufficiency in the crises of life. Help me to see how good thy will is, even when it crosses mine. Teach me to be pleased with thy will. And if not, let me resign myself to thy wiser determinations. I don't know when I've heard that kind of prayer. And this little book is filled with them. One of the great tragedies is that today in America, with a Western, modern culture of view of God, we have kind of lost perspective. A.W. Tozer, 75 years ago, said he feared the day that God would be nothing more than big business. And sometimes I think that's what's happened. This is the God business. It could be the insurance business. It could be the grocery business. But we have a product and we need to sell it and we need to produce, so we need buyers. That is not what the message has ever been about. That is a totally apostate, erroneous view of the faith. A few years ago, a book was written. John Krakauer wrote the book, Into Thin Air. The book was written as a result of him being asked by a sports magazine to do a study of Mount Everest. There have been under 500 people who have ever climbed Mount Everest. And so he decided to join a group. And when he joined that group, 
there were 12 of them that began this journey up Mount Everest. They had a base camp, and then there were four camps to the top. Amazingly, they got to the very top and became part of that 500. In the distance, John tells the story that he saw the clouds gathering, and he was quite concerned that maybe we won't get back to the bottom. Traveling with them was a Japanese woman. Her name was Yatsuko. She had climbed, and I'd like the next screen to come up, please. Two screens, thank you. She had climbed six out of the seven major summits in the world. This was her last one. Her dream was to have Japan cheer her at the top of Mount Everest for her country. She, in the trek up the mountain, kept trying to get ahead of the group to be the first one to the top. They arrived at the top, and on their way down, a storm hit. And when that storm hit, five people died. It became a tragic story. A movie was made about it. When they got to the bottom, John is haunted by the memories of everything that took place. And he's talking to his guide. And he's asking his guide about the tragedy of what happened on the mountain. Here's how his guide responded. He said, the reason this happened is because the people forgot the goal. The real goal is never to get to the top of the mountain. The goal is to come safely down from the mountain. It's so amazing how often when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he made an enviable ascent. He was at the top of his game, as we would say. He had the esteem of the world. He had gardens, he had parks, he had servants, and remember, he had a billion dollar a year income. You couldn't ask for any more than Solomon had. He was considered, according to his peers and by the decree of God, the wisest man of the world. Here's a man who had the, if I may use the term, Midas touch. And at the very summit of his climb, realizes, I've been chasing the wrong mountain. Whether we like to admit it or not, our culture gives us a set of priorities and a perspective. And God's Word gives us a set of priorities and perspectives. And sometimes, if we don't do the work we need to do, we don't analyze, are my goals really taking me to my goal? Or are my goals somehow a mixed substitute that are veering me off course and I don't even realize I'm moving off course? There is no greater tragedy than to think we are accomplishing something and to realize that what we were accomplishing is not where we want it to be. As on the screen behind me, we get distracted, we head in the wrong direction, we become sidetracked, and we have the wrong goals in mind. And we don't even realize it. Because with us, it has been a slow addition and not a careful evaluation. Many times we could have changed course, and we did not change course. And as a result, we're trying to include God with a carnal perspective and don't even realize it. Solomon finds himself in this position at chapter 6. He's a success as far as the world's concerned. In his own sight, he's a success. Can you imagine this? Silver as free as gold bricks, as a silver bricks, pardon me, in the street. That's the city he lived in. 
I don't think any of us, if we went to Jerusalem, would say there's a problem here, except for what we know from Scripture, which is the problem. A healthy perspective may not be a biblical perspective. Feeling comfortable about ourselves may not be a biblical perspective. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves, where does the right priority and perspective in life begin? And so Solomon gives us four basic thoughts. Notice, if you will, please, if Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 6 and verse 10. Whatever one is, he has already been named, for it is known that he is but man. What is Solomon telling us? Solomon is going back to the very dawn of creation and reminding us that the world, our lives, our world, our culture began with a creator. He is taking us back to the dawn of creation and reminding us that God named everything at creation. Remember these words in the book of Genesis, chapter number 1. In the beginning was God and the... Sorry, I'm quoting from John 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. And God spoke. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And the evening and the morning were the... Who named the first day? God did. Think this through for a minute. And on day three, God created the sun and the moon and the stars. And on day six, God created man. Between the sun, moon, and the stars, God created all the life in the air, the birds, and all the life in the sea, uh, uh, fish, and then all the life on the land. Let me ask you a question. Does it ever bother the evolutionists that the very terms that he uses are God's terms. When we talk about things evolving, he's really going back to the fact that God is the one who created and God is the one who named. That may not be significant to you, but take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number one, and let me point out a couple of things for you. And Solomon is going back to this to give us perspective. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let me pause for a moment and ask you, do you realize that the doctrine of the Trinity is in that verse? Let us make man in our own image. The verse goes on to say this, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle of the field, over, uh, pardon me, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, on day six, God created what? What do we call ourselves? Human. Man. We are today, depending upon what your view of creation is, I believe in recent creation, and approximately 6,000 years ago, God created man. 
When God created man, he gave man his name. And 6,000 years later, with 7 billion plus people on the face of the earth, he still has the same name because the creator has the right to choose what will be his creation. Shall the pot say to the potter, why hast thou made me thus? Solomon begins to look at his perspective on life, and he doesn't begin with where he is. He begins with where God began. You see, when you pick the Bible up, what the Bible teaches us that is that there was a time, if we can use that term, though we're in eternity past, there was a time there was only God. And at that time, the Godhead had the desire for whatever reason. Someone said God was lonely. If God was ever lonely, then he's not God. Because that would mean he needs. That is not biblical, even though it sounds sweet to an emotional thinking person. God desired to create humanity. Why? Because God wanted us to reflect his image. God wanted to see the glory of the greatness and goodness of God reflected in this creation. And yes, he himself is present and he himself sometimes shows us himself. But why is it I can look at a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful sunset, and the name of God does not occur on the sky, but I see God in it. I stand on the mountain range and I look across another couple of mountain ranges and I stand in awe at the glory of God. I look at trees that rise into the sky, 50, 75 feet. I look at the beauty of blossoms in the spring and I see God even though God does not put his name there. Stop. What's the point? God does not have to put his name center stage to be present. That's where Solomon is taking us. God intended that we reflect God by who we are and what we are, not just that we are good people. And with all due respect, I say this very kindly. Turn over one page in Ecclesiastes to Ecclesiastes 7.20 and Solomon tells us there's not a good man, a just man that is upon the earth and does good and sins not. How about saying this to yourself? A little bit shocking, but why don't you look at yourself and say, you know what, you're a dirty scoundrel, and if it weren't for the grace of God, you couldn't even be stood by anyone. Now you've got a biblical perspective. Because of the influence of the Bible, because of the influence of Christianity, because of the influence of the church, because of the influence of godly families and of godly culture, because our evil is somewhat restrained, we begin to pat ourselves on the back. We think pretty good about ourselves. Solomon says it doesn't begin there. It begins with God creating man, and God gave him his name, and that's going to become important. Because the key to the glory of God is being under the authority of God. What did God tell Adam he was to do? There's now nine of us. He told Adam that he had authority over all of the animals. God had direct authority, and God gave indirect authority, but it's the principle of authority to Adam. Turn to Genesis chapter 2, and notice, if you will, Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, notice, if you will, verse 19. Genesis 2, verse 19. Listen carefully. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would. Do you understand the principle of naming is the principle of authority? Watch this. Watch this. 
a beautiful baby girl is born into our family. I take that baby girl and I raise it up to praise God and to surrender that baby to God. And I look over at the doctor and I say to the doctor, what would you like to name her? Naming is about authority. Watch this. Watch this. Take your Bible and go back in your mind to the story of Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. They were taken from Jerusalem into Babylon, and when they went to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar changed their names. Their names were changed, not Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, but you know them as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Why change their name? Because naming is about authority. Oh, take your Bible and in your mind go back to the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 11. Only it was Abram. And you travel and to the point you get to Genesis chapter 17. And God says, I'm changing your name from Abram to Abraham. And her name from Sarai to Sarah. And it's about authority. Simon's name was Simon until Jesus took authority in his life and named him Simon Peter. What is Solomon beginning with? Solomon is reminding us that God who created the world and has ruled the world before I stepped on it has the right to control my life. And I do not begin to live life like God intended it to be lived until I submit to all divine and all delegated authority from God. I cannot be surrendered to him. Can you picture a teenage kid saying to God, God, I trust you, I'll obey you, but I ain't following my dad. I won't listen to my mom. That is rebellion, and it's rebellion against the system God set up. Watch this. I'm driving down the road, I'm speeding, and the policeman gives me a ticket, and I say, I'm not doing anything about this ticket, and get out of my face, I'm sick and tired of you, and I start heading down the road, and in a few minutes, another police car pulls me over. And he said, do you understand what you just did? And yeah, I told him I didn't want the piece of paper. No, you fought God's system. You resisted the whole system. You're disrupting the whole order of the universe. And if you want to be in God's will, you get back into the system God created. And predestination is not just about a strange plan out in the future. It's about recognizing the same God who has traveled in the past is moving in the present and headed to the future. And if I want to be in God's plan, I step back in and say, God, before I arrive, this is how it was. Now that I'm here, this is the way it is. And in the future, this is the way it'll be. And I'm willing to work with your plan. Huh. You mean I can't be in God's will if I'm rejecting authority? I mean it without any reservation. And I don't even apologize for it because it isn't about people. It isn't about humanity. It's about you don't really trust God. You think that what God intended has to be determined by you and not by those God put over you. And that's a violation of what the Bible teaches. And Solomon understood it. Do you know why he's saying that? Solomon made some very tragic mistakes. One of his mistakes was he took on God when he built on the hill of evil counsel all of those pagan idols to please his wife. The fact that God is in control is stated in Job 38 and verse number 7. Notice on the screen behind me. God told Job very simply in verse 3, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. I'm here to tell you that for every logical reason you can think of why God's plan doesn't work or God's system isn't right, 
There is no biblical answer to contradict the fact that God put the plan in place. And Solomon understood it. And he violated, as we shall see in just a moment. Turn back to Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and notice a second truth. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse number 10. And the last half of the verse will be the focus here. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Notice, if you will, please, verse 10 again. Whatever one is, he has been named in the past already. For it is known he is but a man. And he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Principle number two. Right now, God is sovereign with whatever's going on in our world. Do you really believe that? Some of us don't. We really don't. Because the proof of it is how we respond to it. A response to sovereignty involves rest. God's on the throne. God's in control. Things aren't out of hand. I don't know what's going to happen. I have news for you. None of us do. Do you realize God doesn't want us to know? Years ago, I worked with two organizations in helping correct problems that existed in churches. I found it very interesting. If you would say to me, who's the leader of the church? I would start to name officers and uh, teachers and people in positions of authority. And in my training, I was surprised to know there are people who never want a position, but they like to pull the strings. How do they pull the strings? There are several ways they can pull them. It's simple as complaining. I don't like the way things are, and rumbling, 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 pulling the strings. There are others, grunt. It's going to be my way or the highway. I'm telling you, that's what I want. There are others who don't take either approach, but in reality, they want people to gather around them as a powerhouse. Knowledge. Information. Oh, you want to know who said that? You want to know where that started? You want to know who's involved in that? You know where it began? All of a sudden, people that are not leaders are leaders. And Solomon is telling us here, the key is all of us have to submit. That's what the faith is all about. Trusting a known God in an unknown world. Trusting a good God in a bad world. Trusting a gracious plan in the midst of a lot of uncertainty. You see, if I have to know, you can say you trust God, but you can't trust God if you have to know. The moment I have to know, you know what I've said? God, you owe me an account. I have made myself God. Mystery is part of what God intends. Uncertainty is part of what God intends. And when Solomon comes to this passage, Solomon reminds us, what in the world do you think you're doing, Solomon? You're bucking God. Do you realize what a fool you are? All of the fussing and fighting and feuding and all of the rebellion and challenging and demanding, your problem's with God. It isn't with this. It's the person in charge. I read a very interesting story written by a pastor. He wrote, I started a new church. I was soon overwhelmed with the pressure and stress, sometimes 70 hour work weeks, depressing worries and inability to sleep climbed on me. When we moved into our new home, I saved the heaviest piece of furniture for the last. It was the desk for my office. 
As I was pushing and pulling my desk with all my might, my four-year-old son came over to ask me if he could help. I smiled, sure. Together we started sliding the desk across the carpet. He was pushing and grunting and straining as we inched along. Then after a few minutes, he looked up and met me, me and he said, Dad, you're in my way. Then he tried to push it by himself. Of course it didn't budge. As I stood there and thought, it occurred to me. I'm handling my problem just like he's handling the desk. I haven't realized it, but God is in my way of what I want to do. Solomon realizes what's going on in his own life. Larry Crabb, I keep trying to grab for something I don't need to grab for. Larry Crabb says this very interesting definition of sin. You think of sin as wine, women, and song. But if there is no God, there is no sin. All sin has to be indirectly at God, if not directly at God. The reason something's morally wrong is because God said it is. That's what makes it wrong. Here's good. It's all God-centered, God-focused. Larry Crabb said, sin is saying to God, I'll find another way to make my life work without your intrusion or your inhibitions. It's saying to God, my way, not your way. I don't care what your way is. It's getting in my way. And I reject it. I may be ethically and morally from the cultural standpoint doing right, but I am not scripturally doing right, and Solomon isn't either. I find it shocking how far astray Solomon has gone. Take your Bible, turn back to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. First, I said 29, pardon me, 28. 1 Chronicles 28. David is on his deathbed. He is about to leave this world and step into the presence of God. And last words so often are very important because they really reveal the heart like no other words. And so as Solomon comes in to see his father, David is making one appeal to Solomon. Notice verse 9 of chapter 8. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Consider now. For the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Let me stop and ask you. Do you realize that Solomon's job was to build a temple and to rule a city, to rule a kingdom? David's concern was not ruling or building. Those are assumptions that are clearly the postscript to the real issue. Sometimes we get the horse behind the cart. The real issue is not church, as we understand the term culturally. The real issue is the same issue that David was concerned for Solomon. Know the Lord your God. Serve him with a loyal heart and a willing mind. Seek him. Everything is 
God-focused, God-centered. God is the ultimate end. God is the clear directive. A singular path, not multiple paths about God. God is not Rome, and all roads may lead to Rome, but they don't all lead to God. Solomon says today, uh, I saw, I'm sorry, David says to Solomon, keep your focus clear. Know God. Boy, I'm telling you, the way some people know God, you'd think God was nothing but a book. I mean that. Yeah, I've got the facts. God is, God did, God was, God will. I tell you what, I walk into the bedroom and I go to kiss my wife. And my wife says, Shh. You didn't help me when I was trying to do the laundry. You didn't even take out the garbage. In fact, you got up from the table and left your plate on the table. You couldn't even carry your plate to the sink. And look at that shower that you're using. It's filthy. It's not. It's spotless, ladies and gentlemen. She cleaned it. On a serious note now. And I go to kiss her, and she says, you're not kissing me. That's how we do God. I don't care what you want over here. I don't care what you said over there. I don't care what you demand over here. I don't like it this way. I don't like it that way. This is how I feel about, how about a kiss, God? That's not a relationship. To know is intimacy. There are things about my wife and things about me that we know each other like no one else. But in the midst of knowing about each other, there's an attitude that clearly prevails between us. It overrides everything. And the Bible is telling us that David is telling Solomon, get the horse before the cart. Keep your relationship with God first. Know him. If God is truly as infinite as we say he is, would you explain to me how like a book you came to the end, you slammed it shut, and now let's move on to something better? We have a dog and two cats. I can tell you right now, pardon me for being as honest as I am, but I'm going to be. I head to the bathroom, and between the, the, the family room and the bathroom, there's a cabinet, and in that cabinet, there's a ba bag of cat treats. I can tell you just as well as I'm standing here before I ever get to that bathroom, one of my cats can come from wherever, outside the house, inside the house, and be right under that cabinet wanting me to give her some cat treats. I can put a plate on the table and I have a dog and I can guarantee you that dog will be at our feet. And I have to be miserable the whole meal watching that dog begging the whole time. The two cats sleep in our bedroom at night. And when we get into bed and it finally gets quiet, just about the time we're ready to drift off to sleep, all of a sudden, there are two cats. And the male cat jumps up on the window and starts to play with the blinds. And my wife and I have decided the way to solve the problem is we take socks out of the drawer, they lay on the bed, and we have a pitching contest. Now, here's my point. I'm being humorous, but what I'm telling you is we know them. You don't know God like that. Go ahead and quote, do your little ritual, whatever your ritual is. That's not the key. It's going beyond the ritual to reality. And reality is often in the midst of the battle. It's in the midst of the tears. It's in the midst of the confusion where we call our lives to a halt and look to God and say, God, I need you. If you have a ritual, you can be a Roman Catholic and not even know Christ as Savior. I don't mean that critical. I'm trying to wake us up. Solomon is reminding us in the present, you better recognize who God is. Take your Bible, turn back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7.
Notice, if you would, thirdly, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 11. He goes on to say this, beginning in verse 11. Since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? Here's my paycheck. Here's my title. Here's my possessions. Here's my accolades. Here's my high position in life. What do you think of that? Solomon says, okay, let's play that game. Verse 12. For who knows what is good for man in life? All the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? Look at the future. Let me ask you this question. You think you can handle it? How do you know what tomorrow holds? You got a handle on it? Can you predict it? Can you guarantee it? My first church that I ever pastored, I chose not to go to another church because this church was going to be a better church. I'd be better off. I'd have a better chance. I could do a better job and end up with a better record and then climb a better ladder. I got to the first church, and it didn't take me but four or five days to realize, buddy, you made a big, big, big mistake. One of the neighbors across the street meet them, found out years later she's the mother of a member of my church, walk across the street and invite her to church. Her, I've recently moved here and become the pastor of the church. You're the pastor of Custer Park Baptist Church? Yeah. Well, I want you to know I will never attend your church. What? I mean, look how close we are. You're not going to church. You just told me you're not in church. Why don't you come to our church? Well, first of all, I have seen too many fights from people in your church. I know, and she named two women in the church. I saw them with pulling one another's hair out right in front of the church in the church lawn over the fact they were mad about something that didn't go the way they wanted. I'm totally embarrassed. I don't even know how to respond. I said, well, I'll, I'll try and talk to them. And did, but it took me quite a long time to finally get around to it. But here's my point. God said, Tom, I want you to learn some lessons, and you're not going to learn them in ideal circumstances. You learn them in adverse circumstances. I want you to grow but you're not going to grow unless you're put in the middle of some manure. And so, Tom, I'm going to give you a situation you don't like, you can't handle, you need to stretch through, and I'm going to make you a better man for it. And that's exactly what Solomon is realizing. Everything going for him, look what it did to him. Have you thought it through? great name. Not a single power in the world would bother him. Plenty of money, the pride of his people, and in the midst of it all, he totally lost perspective. And now he builds a hill of evil counsel, and he forgets God. I close with this story. Supposedly a true story, not mine, but I read it somewhere. And I'm going to bring it tonight. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm finite? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. My question is, as a congregation, when do we get real with God?
When did we get play, quit playing the game? Because that's what we do. What we treat God is nothing more than a product that we have rather than a person we serve. And you can't serve him while serving yourself. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we ask you to help us to be real with you and even more so real with ourselves. Because you are not a product and you're not just a person. You're the source of life. You're the source of wisdom. You're the source of beauty. You're the source of goodness. And all of the beauty and goodness and joy we experience in life comes from you. And every time we try and cut corners, we find that what we're really doing is cutting off the opportunity for you to even show yourself greater. Forgive us. We sing the song, break us and mold us and make us. Father, sometimes those words are just words we say and they're not the cry of our heart. And until they're the cry of our heart, only then do you begin to really reveal yourself in a new and fresh way. Deliver us from ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.